So welcome to another session of Study Chess with me, uh, this one on the endgame with Dvoretsky's endgame manual. In the previous session, we had looked at mind squares and we had gone through the lesson as well as the two illustrative examples given by Mark Dvoretsky, one by Alexander Alekhine, and another a very interesting trap um, with a bishop and h-pawn that theoretically would not win, but managed to turn into a trap converting into a mind square. Um, now we are at the exercises, and Dvoretsky's exercises have always been really difficult. Honestly, I've only managed one. Close a few times, but only really one that I managed to really solve. And here he actually gives you a warning. He says, look, these exercises are really difficult. You're warned. That has me kind of nervous because he doesn't usually give that kind of warning. So for him to say it, he's expecting a real challenge. So this is the position, as you can see. And he asks, basically, should black enter the pawn endgame or not? This exercise and the next one will be asking that exact same question. So the question really is, after rook takes d7, bishop takes d7, king takes d7, can black enter that pawn endgame safely or not? And it's up for us to figure this out. So let's take a look at this. So I've spent considerable time studying this position, and I'll, I suspect that I'm going to get punished for this, but I believe what black can enter this pawn endgame. I've analyzed a lot of different variations, um, many that end up in mind square situations, and I believe that black is okay. I will present, therefore, the lines that I've analyzed and why I believe black can enter this pawn end game safely. So obviously let's first look at the actual end game because the rooks here are designed to test you in a game situation which you might face, for example, like this. And you'll be asking yourself, can I take on d7? Or am I going to just lose because I did not properly calculate or judge that pawn end game? So rook takes d7, rook takes d7, king takes d7. And the first thing I analyzed was really f4 or g3. And what black can do. Now f4 presented a lot of situations that end up in potential mind square situations. So very much in alignment with the lesson of the day. And as far as I can tell, black is okay in all of them. So let's take a look at them. Let's try f4 because that was actually the line that I ended up calculating the most. So f4. And now obviously you cannot take. That's the first thing you need to check. And the reason is simply that you're going to end up in a situation where you have a past h pawn against the past f pawn with the king, white king here and black is going to have to chase the h pawn and you're just dead so in a quick illustration you take king here king here take fourth g3 pawn takes what else are you going to do on here king g5 it doesn't matter king check king h5 king f4 king here king here and i'm just going to run all the way over here and thank you very much. So you don't take on f4, obviously. Instead, you're going to play g4, since of course you can't just leave the pawn. So you play g4. And the next question is, can white take? No, white can definitely not take. If you take, you're going to end up with a situation like this, where you're going to have the h pawn that can advance and yeah i just don't see how white can force the situation white can't really 
move his king around um, without worrying about that H pawn coming in to bite him in the butt. So yeah, I don't see how this is going to work. So you can't take on G4. And as a result, white can try something else. White can try G3, perfectly reasonable. So play G3. And black has two ways of answering. You can either take on G3 or you can take on H3. So the first thing I analyzed was taking on H3 and it turned out to be enough. So you take on H3, take on H4, King E6, King G3, King F6, King H3, King G6. And there's really no way for white to force this situation. It doesn't actually matter if you try to push h5, I should point out, but I'll show you both lines. King here, king h5, king here, and white has nothing. So what if you try to take? What if you try instead to play king g3, king h5, king f3, and to go around? Okay, so we'll do that. you lost. Fine. So what about h5? So move h5 and force the king around. Now you won't lose immediately, but you will end up losing if you try to force it. And it goes like this. After h5, king g7, of course you have to go around. King takes h3. I mean, you have to deal with that pawn someday. And of course, you cannot play king h6, because then you just lose. King h4, and black has to move away. King g5, game over. Fine. So you don't fall on your sword for white's benefit. You'll play king h7. Now, if you play king h4, white will play, black will play king h6. Fair enough. And if you play king g3, we play king g7. Of course, if you play king h6, same situation as before. So king g7, king f3. Oh, it looks like we've made progress. Yeah, it's just an illusion. So now, of course, king h6. Try to go around, king a3, king h5, king e3, here, king here. And now, obviously not the so-called mind square situation where you play here. And of course, you're just lost. So you go around, king h4, and you can try to control it with king d5, because of course, if you go to king here, then again, it's black who wins, but it won't matter. Play king g3, you have no choice, and black wins. So yeah, so this line doesn't work for white at all. So f4 doesn't really seem to hold any future. Fine. What about g3? Well, g3 is has a an interesting answer. And the answer is not king e6. If you play king e6, you're lost. If you play king e6, then white plays f4, and you actually are going to be able to force that h against f pawn situation. But black doesn't have to do that. And it's the same problem if you take on g3. Oops, my bad. Instead of king e6, if you take on g3, same problem. King takes, king e6. And what do you do now? You can play here and whatever, but same problem. f against h. But black doesn't have to do that. Black just played really simple. After g3, just play f4. Lock up the situation. White doesn't have any choices. You can either play g4 and give uh, a tempo for free to black, or you can take on one of the pawns. Doesn't matter. And how on earth do you plan to win this? You can't. So as far as I'm concerned, 
yes, black can enter this endgame. But maybe there's something completely obvious that I missed. And if so, I'll be very curious to see what Varetsky has to say about it. It's okay. But I have spent time on it, as you can see. Um, okay, so here's the answer. The position is based on the themes of an Estrin Gusev in ending, Moscow 1963. Now, Estrin, Yakov Estrin, I don't know if this is, he doesn't tell, say if this is a correspondence game, but Yakov Estrin was a world correspondence chess champion. Uh, he did play, of course, live chess, which is why I say I don't really know which it is. I don't know who Gusev is. So if they're both uh, famous uh, correspondence chess players, then I can't say. But Estrin and Berliner played some very famous games. And, okay, so. Black should focus on, t on the task at hand and calculate the following forced drawing line. Rook takes d7. Oh, yes. And he puts an exclamation point. <laughs> if he had put a question mark, I would be here going, oh, missed it again. <sighs> so let's see if I got the lines right at least. <laughs> Otherwise... Um, so he says, if black, okay, if black postpones the transition to the pawn ending playing f4, for example, an interesting idea, he says, uh, with the idea of king e2, rook takes d7, Black seizes the opposition when the white king enters the fourth rank. He will have serious troubles in the rook and pawn endgame after rook c2 check, king takes d7, rook c5, king, rook g8, king e2, etc. Okay. So, rook takes d7, king takes 7, king takes 7, f4, exclamation point. Okay. g4. Now, of course, not g takes f4. As we saw. Fair enough. g3. Pawn takes h3. Double exclamation point for black. Yay. Um, but like I said, I analyzed both lines, so sure. And I didn't actually analyze the other line simply because I found this to be enough. It has to be pointed out. If you find a line that's, and the answer, the question really is, is black going to lose this? And I calculated that it wasn't going to lose it after this. Why would I analyze the alternative since it's black's choice? So g takes h4, king e6, king g3, king f6, h5. And he says king takes h3, King g6 is a draw. Okay. H5. And remember, this is only, it only went bad when I tried to force the issue with white. It wasn't that white was forced to go around to try to win. It was just an example that white cannot win by trying that. H5, King g7, King takes h3, King h7, King g3, King j7, and the h4 and h6 squares are mined. Yes! So we got that right. Way to go. Second position I managed to solve in this. I'm pretty pleased, I have to tell you. Uh, excellent. Okay. On to the second position. So an encouraging start with um, a correct solution for the first one. And this is the second position. And the exercise um, is the same. I'll read it to you. The exercise is rather difficult. You must judge whether black ought to go into the pawn endgame. And it's between, it's from a game from uh, Mark Taimanov and Mikhail Botvinnik. And of course, black to play. So let's get to it. I think I've already found the solution. I didn't spend all that long figuring it out. So in view of the comment or warning 
by Mark Dvoretsky that this is a rather difficult position, I would not be surprised if I've missed something completely obvious, which would make the solution I have either incomplete or just downright wrong. I do believe, however, that Black can comfortably enter this pawn endgame and would be winning if White is so uh, courageous as to, well, suicidal, uh, if I'm right, uh, as to enter it voluntarily. So let me give you my solution. So as I said, I believe Black can do this. And after Rook G4, um, White's Rook takes G4, Pawn takes G4, I believe Black is winning. Now, obviously, Black is already up a pawn, so the question really is, can he convert this? Because there might be some shenanigans. And there are some mind square themes here, but I don't believe that this is anything that uh, Black can't overcome. So, okay, so I'll show you my solution. I have two lines, and basically they both involve playing G5 with Black immediately, as opposed to running with the king. These were actually the first moves I considered. So rook g4, rook takes, pawn takes, king g2, no problem. And here, both of my lines involve g5 immediately. So g5, and I'll go for the first solution, which is to simply ignore the pawn and try to push this with h5. And here we enter one of the first um, mind square possibilities, king g7. King g3, it's forced because white really has to come and grab this g5, g4 pawn. Uh, if he hesitates and uh, black plays king h6, it's game over immediately. And here, and here comes the first mind square uh, aspect. You do not play, of course, king h6, because obviously the two mind squares are h6 and g4. The advantage that black has, of course, is that Black is covering these two squares as well. So while Black can play uh, King G7, King H7, and back and forth, White doesn't have that luxury. White is, unfortunately, I can either go grab G4 or stay where he is. He cannot move back and forth, and that's the reason why it's immediately deadly. So King G3, King H7, as I said. King takes g4. It doesn't really matter if you take it immediately or you start moving the uh, pawns. Um, I will show you why. King here. And then it just becomes a question of mirroring what white does with his pawns. See, in this position, black can either move two squares or one. And black, white has one square away from that immediate two-square jump. And it's a mirror situation on the other. So basically, if white, for example, were to play a4, just as an example, black will respond immediately the same thing on the other side, e5. Here, here, it doesn't matter which one. And you've won the uh, mind square situation. OK. And we can look at this dirt deeper if you prefer. But yeah. And the pawn is going to come here faster. The king is in front. Yeah, there's nothing here. So this is one example of the mind square situation. Now, this is if you choose to advance h5. But of course, you can also simply move your king forward. I don't see any future in this because after this, it's an easy win. So instead, white will move forward with king g3, and black responds likewise, king g6. Now, of course, you can't take. We already saw that. You can't play h5. We saw that. So king takes g4. I mean, what are you going to do? And then you play. Pawn takes h4, king takes h4, king f5, king g3, king e4, king f2. 
And we're going to come into a funny little situation, but it's not a problem because of Black's huge luxury of being able to choose either one or two Tempe with that Black Pawn. So we'll just play along with these pawns, a5. We'll leave these pawns. We'll leave this pawn for the last, since the last thing you really uh, white really wants is for that black pawn to start moving as far as possible. It's never going to be good for him. But let's see what happens anyway. King e2. Okay. A5. A3. And we just play one move pawn. Now you play either king d2 or king f2. It doesn't matter much. It's always one square. King here, king here, one square again, and it's game over. You can't really come here, you can't come here, and as a result, you're going to be basically locked off this pawn very soon. And it's game over. It's important to note that one square is absolutely crucial because in this situation, you can actually get into a really bad situation. If I were to play, for example, e5, King d2, king here, king here, e4, suddenly you've lost the mind square battle. Oops. But okay, that was the one little subtlety I saw. And I believe this is the overall solution. If I miss something, well, we'll find out really soon. I'm kind of curious, actually. Well, kind of curious? No, I'm dying to know. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's take a look. Okay. And he says, Rook G4, exclamation point. So it would seem I was right. And let's see what the lines say, though. Now he points out, of course, that Rook takes A6. Rook takes H4 is winning. Of course, the two flanked pawns connected are just deadly. I didn't really analyze this in depth for the solution because, well, I saw it really fast and it didn't bother me. And I didn't think it was going to be, he was going to be asking this question if it was going to be so easily sidestepped. Play rook g4, white plays rook takes a6, and you're a draw. Well, then why even ask the question? So rook g4, exclamation point, rook takes g4, h takes g4, king g2, g5, exclamation point. Aha! So we got that right. And here he points out two different lines. Okay, so the main line is with h5, which I had actually pointed out. Oh, looks like I got it right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you the main line. And then there's a little line. He actually points out king g3 as well. Actually, let's take a quick look at queen g3, see what he says. King g6, king takes g4 does not help. g takes h4, king f5. This is his line. King e4, king e4, king f2, and then he points out a5. Yeah, he says e5 would be a mistake in those lines, if there's a parenthesis here. So he says king d3, king f3, e5 would be a mistake. Okay, this would transpose to the line I pointed out where e5 was just a major mistake. There's no need to hurry it. a5, king e2. A4, exactly what I said, or E6, exclamation point. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I know, I shouldn't be doing that on camera, but, you know, it's the second solution I got correctly with mind squares, admittedly. Um, I'm very happy because I've gotten so many of these things wrong in the past. So this is the second correct one I get in a row, both of them on the theme of mind squares. Well, I hope uh, life doesn't present me with an ironic situation which I screwed up in a real game. That would be terrible. Knock on wood. Knock on wood. Um, anyway. So, h5, king g7, king g3, king h7. Oh, yes! And he points out this is exactly like the Alakin Yates game, which actually I had noticed. I didn't bring it up, but I had noticed it. King takes g4, king h6, e4. And yeah, and white resigned in view of, and here he gives the whole line, e4, a4, exactly, a parallel, a mirror, e4, e5, king f5, king takes h5, etc. Brilliant. So, two successful solutions to the exercise. I'm very pleased. 
you already saw that. And yeah, we'll be going on to the lesson um, ahead in the next video on the end games. But the actual next video in the study with me sessions will be on tactics. I look forward to having you join me. Thank you very much. Happy chess and good mates.